Alan Wake 2 is a rather sublime looking game, and the hardware path tracing and ray tracing exclusive to the PC version elevate it to a pinnacle of real-time rendering. In today's video for Digital Foundry, I will explore how the ray tracing works in Alan Wake 2, taking you on a tour of what it brings to the game. I will also talk to you a bit about tweaking its quality to make it more viable for older, less capable GPUs. And lastly, I will talk a bit about DLSS ray reconstruction, how it is looking here in the game, and its positives and negatives. To start the video off, let us begin in a classic North American institution, a diner. I think the Oh Dear Diner in Alan Wake 2 just looks positively wonderful. And it looks so positively wonderful as we're seeing here with ray tracing, but it also looks pretty great without it. And that's what this looks like. Here is a real-time rendered image of one of the diner booths in Alan Wake 2, and none of the hardware ray tracing options are enabled here. I think it looks great even without RT. Really top of the class rendering there for titles without RT. At this camera angle, the various techniques that Remedy uses for reflections, shadows, and bounce lighting do shine, but I think we could agree it could be better. Now, here is where I will turn on one of the first RT effects to make it better, and that is ray traced direct lighting. Now this primarily makes it so all lighting sources will be using ray trace shadows. For our dining booth here, this has a few important consequences. For one, the shadow map errors on the backrest here of the booth disappear. Shadow maps can be a bit of a testy technique that will be rife with problems that may need workarounds, and this is a fail area that we can see here where flickering is brought into the image. So the image will be more stable with ray tracing on. Another thing not seen in the still image of this booth is how the ray trace direct lighting helps with cascade issues from shadow maps. Check out this zooming shot here of the camera moving forward. I want you to pay attention to the shadow from the bush in the center of the screen. On the left with cascaded shadow maps, you can see hard cuts between the various resolutions of the cascades, causing noticeable and abrupt jumps in shadow quality as the camera gets further away or closer to the bush. This is a problem cascaded shadow maps have. With the ray trace shadows on the right, we can see how the shadow of that bush stays similarly detailed throughout the camera's movement arc toward it. It doesn't show the comparatively obvious to see snapping behavior in the shadows, so it'll look more stable. With this, I'm trying to show you that ray traced images in still side-by-sides can often look more similar than they do actually in the real game when a camera is moving. When cameras move in games, that's when you tend to see some of the bigger differences actually in rendering quality. But even with a still camera, we can see some great increases to detail thanks to the ray trace direct lighting. Let's go back to the diner again. Take note of the shadows from the crocheted curtains here. With the typical rendering we see on the left, the shadow map resolution at this range really can't cope and solve the shadows there from the curtains. The ray trace direct lighting though does it incredibly well, showing each and every bit of the shadow casting from those crocheted details with per pixel precision. The denoiser here for the ray tracing using ray reconstruction as I'm using here can resolve ridiculously fine detail. And you'll find this all throughout the game, where the shadows cast by light sources or from the main character's flashlight will show off greater detail with ray tracing on. Razor sharp shadows, where you can see every little bit of the geometric detail in the shadows, while the shadow maps may in comparison struggle with their limited resolution to capture all the detail in the game. And there's a lot of geometric detail in this game. But that doesn't mean shadows are universally sharp or anything like that with the direct lighting enabled. Check out this shot here of a chain link fence. On the other side of this fence is a large area light source. And with the direct lighting on on the right here, we can see how we get accurate penumbra effects. The shadow starts off perfectly pin sharp with a full on umbra shadow, but as the shadow moves away from the fence casting it, it gets more diffuse as the size of the area light makes it so that the umbra in the shadow primarily disappears. On the other hand, with shadow maps on the left, we can see how the shadow sharpness is universally the same, which really makes no physical sense. The variability of hardness or softness in the shadows can really make some scenes, like here in the woods on the left where all the shadows are universally soft and diffuse with the shadow maps. On the right with direct lighting ray tracing, we can see great variation in the sharpness of shadows. Some, like those from faraway trees here, are nice and soft, while others that are closer to the objects casting to them are razor sharp. This might be a minor detail for some of you out there, but I think it actually enhances the scenes greatly, capturing a realism that you don't often see in video games.
Okay, so let's get back to the diner and the game scene without any hardware ray tracing. Now let's add on full multi-bounce indirect lighting into the image in addition to the direct lighting we had before. Now I think you should see there are some rather large differences here, and I will concentrate on a few specifically. First is the most subtle one, but it is fundamental. If you look at the napkin dispenser's reflection in both images, I want you to see how the left image of the napkin dispenser reflection kind of starts to disappear towards the top of the reflection. And notice at the bottom of the reflection, where the reflection meets the bottom of the dispenser, how it looks completely attached even though the dispenser is actually elevated on pegs. This makes no physical sense, of course. The reason for this is because the reflection on the left and all the smaller reflections in the image on the left here are done primarily in screen space. As we can see when I move the camera up and down with the game not having hardware ray tracing on, we'll see that nearly all of the reflections in the image will completely disappear as the objects and surfaces reflected are no longer in screen space. This is a huge difference between hardware ray tracing being on and off, and as we can see here with the hardware ray tracing on, no such thing occurs because the game is tracing outside of screen space. Now this is a really big difference in the game, and it can lead to results like this. For example, where we see here where, check out the scene with Saga staring at this wall and door that I'm looking at. There are windows behind Saga that are lighting this room up, but since those windows are not in screen space, you cannot see much of the reflectivity from them. The wall and the door, as a result, look rather matte, as the other reflection systems in the game do not have the fidelity to capture the things off screen with a great enough precision. With the path tracing engaged now, we can see a variety of reflections being added into the mix here that really up the realism, and it really ups the material quality. We can see really soft and diffuse reflections in the wood grain on the wall. We also get really clear and sharp reflections off the glass cover from the photo that is hung on the wall. And in that glass reflection, we can see how there's differing levels of roughness on the glass. It's not just completely pin sharp. And lastly, my favorite reflection is that one on the varnished door, which I just think looks ultra cool and looks like something you'd see in real life, a varnished wooden door. That's a material type you don't see too often represented well in video games. But like I said earlier with the shadows, static images don't actually do the differences justice. Ray tracing is much more transformative in this game when the camera is moving. As we can see here, when SSR is being obscured, it creates really big disconnects in fidelity that will take you out of the scene, and this doesn't happen at all with hardware ray tracing active. This issue of disocclusion of screen space reflections affects all the materials in the game actually. So many materials that are rough or very smooth in Alan Wake without ray tracing don't look completely right, but then look a lot more correct with the ray tracing on. These ray trace reflections make a big change to the game's visuals in all those scenes with more modern materials in them, plastic metals, polished woods, and whatnot. One thing that Alan Wake 2 does differently than other games do is that the reflections are path traced. In other games, like we can see here, the world in the reflections is pretty simplified. There's not much lighting information there to keep the performance up, so shadows, shading, and interreflections are just really missing or don't look right. In comparison, reflections in Alan Wake 2 trace up to three bounces of light. So in reflections, you can have highly detailed lighting and reflections and shadows. Like this shot here of Alan Wake in the rounded surveillance mirror. We can see how Alan Wake has his flashlight out and there's light spilling behind him from the open door. And we can also see bounce lighting from that light spilling out the door on the adjacent wall. If we compare to the software ray trace reflections using sign distance field that the game otherwise uses with hardware ray tracing off, I think it's obvious enough to say that there are generational differences in fidelity here when you turn on the ray tracing. And thanks to the path tracing of light, those things that are reflected in a number of scenes look rather good in the reflections. Whereas the game without hardware ray tracing and just screen space reflections and the software ray tracing technique can look pretty weird and unnatural especially when there's a lot more reflective things on screen, such as mirrors. Going back to the diner again, another thing that the path traced indirect lighting gives us is less noise in the reflections. We can see this on the back rest of the booth again. 
On the left hand side of the image without hardware ray tracing, we can see there's this kind of speckled look in the reflection on the backrest. Now that isn't detail there, it's actually just an artifact of the game's SSR and software ray tracing, which thanks to higher precision and modern denoising is completely missing in the right hand side image with hardware ray tracing. This difference in noise is more obvious in other scenes, like this one here. Here I'm showing you this scene with hardware ray tracing off, and this couch looks a little weird I would say. There's speckled noise from the game's software ray tracing that is giving it a stippled look. When we turn on hardware ray tracing, it is denoised rather intensely, so we can see how it looks a lot less like there's holes in the couch or that the couch is made of some sort of reflective sandpaper. And that is a general upgrade that this game gets when you turn on the hardware ray tracing. There's a lot less image noise due to the SSR and software ray trace reflections no longer being used. So that covers specular lighting path tracing, or reflections as they're commonly called. Another thing that the path tracing in Alan Wake does is it also covers diffuse lighting, so dull surfaces and their interreflections of light. This is what people tend to mean when they use the phrase global illumination. This is an area in Alan Wake that looks particularly awesome, I would say, with hardware ray tracing, but it is also done in a very different way than previous path trace titles we've seen, like Cyberpunk 2077, and it's going to need some extra explanation. But before I get into that, let me talk about what it does add to the image in the diner scene again, where once again we're looking at it here without any hardware RT, and once again let me turn on the direct lighting plus indirect path trace lighting. The diffuse interreflections that I want to call out very specifically are in this little bowl here, holding the heavy cream packets. I think it's obvious when I put these two images side by side which one is more realistic, but I'm going to describe why I think it is that case. On the image on the right, we can see the sunlight hitting the blue bowl, which then bounces blue tinged light off of it onto the table and adjacent windowsill. It also bounces the color from the bowl in the bowl itself. So it adds a blue tinge to the creamer packets in there, and we also see the sunlight bouncing off those little creamer packets as well, adding in a lot more local color variation and contrast in the inside of the bowl. To describe it in simple aesthetic terms, the image on the right has the objects gelling much more with each other. They're grounded and their lighting is interrelated. That is the power of path tracing on a small scale. We can see that in another scene here, where path tracing in Alan Wake 2 for diffuse lighting helps ground things into the scene on a smaller scale. Here Alan Wake's flashlight is illuminating the ground on both sides of this image, left and right. But on the right hand side, we can see that the path tracing captures the light of that flashlight bouncing around the scene. It's lighting up Alan's pant leg and the traffic cone itself, and it makes the image just look a lot more natural, I would say. And this is the general difference you will see with path tracing on for a lot of the smaller features in Alan Wake 2's visuals. A lot of small light bounce detail. But on a larger scale, turning on path tracing actually will not always create very big differences in the lighting, and that is because Alan Wake is doing something a bit strange, I would say. Based on what I can see, Alan Wake 2 is mixing the results from path tracing with the larger scale global illumination that the game uses when hardware ray tracing is set to off. And there's some good evidence of that in the game. Check out this area here where we can see that the path tracing is off. And notice how we can see some large aliasing in the lighting of this image that is produced by the global illumination with hardware ray tracing off. The lighting and shadows here look like a low resolution texture, a representation of what lighting is in a degraded form. If we switch on path tracing, I want you to notice two things. For one, that low res aliased look is still there in the lighting. So it appears that the path tracing is being blended with this other lighting technique. But one thing you should notice is that the hard aliased lines that made it look like a low res texture are much softened due to the path tracing kind of blending over them. As a result of this behavior, I would say path tracing in Alan Wake 2 isn't really pure, as the standard system for GI is also being used in some capacity underneath it all throughout the entire game. And that is why when you turn on and off path tracing in some scenes, it doesn't change the look of the game in a really big way. Unlike say in Cyberpunk 
2077 where turning on the overdrive ray tracing there will lead to huge differences. The upside to this in Alan Wake 2 is that people without path tracing get good enough diffuse global illumination in the game, and technically the path tracing might need less denoising work, for example. But the downside of it is that the path tracing will inherit visual errors from the other GI solution that is running in tandem with it. Take this area here inside this building. This is with the path tracing off, and if we look, I think it's pretty easy to see that there's something wrong with the image. The GI solution here is too low fidelity to capture the finer geometry detail in the scene, like the table and the chair. So the light is leaking through this geometry onto the ground. The chair legs and the table support almost look like they're floating above the ground as the light is leaking through them. Now if I turn on path tracing, we can see that that same look is actually maintained there. The path tracing is inheriting the issues from whatever other GI solution is being used in the game as they're blended together. With this, you can see areas in the game where the other GI solution tends to bring up errors in the path tracing. A good example of the errors that you'll see from the mixing of the GI systems is at the thresholds of buildings in the forest sections of the games, like at windows or at doors. Take notice here, for example in this shot, how Saga is not casting a shadow with path tracing on even though the light is spilling into the room and across her. With pure path tracing, you would really expect that, but here the other GI solution is overriding the light. Light. It's almost as if diffuse rays cannot leave this building. You can see that as well with the game's leaves. Now the leaves in the game world outside of indoor areas will always have perfect shadow casting and perfect indirect lighting. But when they are indoors, like you can see here at the threshold of the door, they'll have improper lighting applied to them. And this comes from the other GI system in the game overriding the path tracing. Without path tracing on, the game gives these leaves a semblance of shadowing with SSAO. But of course, there is no SSAO with path tracing on as path tracing fully replaces it as it should as SSAO is just a hack. As a result, areas like these in the game at the threshold of doors can look a little bit awkward due to the other GI system in the game overriding the path tracing results. But sometimes the path tracing can help the image out in spite of the errors. For example here. Here is all the hardware ray tracing set to off again and with the standard GI solution we can see the light leaking through the wall here. I think it's a bit distracting in this otherwise rather dark scene. But with path tracing set to on we can see how it eliminates most of the light leaking here and it just leaves a tiny little dull amount of light leak in the corner. So the path tracing can help improve the results of the other GI solution. In the end, I'm a little torn on the lighting setup here for path tracing in Alan Wake 2. The game does look really, really good, and I love the way the path tracing alters the specular lighting of the game, as in all the reflections, but the way it affects diffuse lighting is a bit mixed. Since it uses the other GI system that is more prone to errors and is less precise, that means that the path tracing in Alan Wake 2 is less precise and more error prone than we've seen perhaps in other games that use path tracing. But still, the game with path tracing set to on improves detail greatly on a micro scale since the path tracing is much better than the other GI system in handling small detail and small geometry. Okay, so the last bit I want to cover in the diner is ray trace transparency, and adding that in, as we can see here, will add in reflections on transparent surfaces. Here we can see it adds a noticeable reflection on the glass here, where we can now see the table, objects on the table, and the rest of the diner reflected in the glass window, which really just wasn't there in a good way with it off. As I pointed out earlier, these reflections on transparent surfaces are not just full mirror reflections. There's a varying level of roughness there where we can see glass surfaces having scuffs, smudges, and dirt on them, and that'll affect the way the reflections look. And this transparency reflection is the bow tie on our ray tracing here, and it helps tie a scene all together. So we started off with this, a good looking rendition of a diner table and booth, but with large inaccuracies. And we end with this, which I think looks extra fantastic. In my opinion, when we flip between these two, we can see a nice generational jump in fidelity on this scale. And once again, this is just a still image. In motion, since we're no longer relying on screen space tracing for anything, 
thing, that means we're going to have the ray traced image looking a lot more stable and noise free. And this stability is something that elevates Alan Wake 2's graphics tremendously. Now before I moved on to how the ray tracing scales on lower GPUs, I want to talk about some idiosyncrasies in Alan Wake 2's ray tracing. One thing that is really cool is how it handles vegetation. With my talking with Remedy at Gamescom, I know that the vegetation of the game is fully represented in the ray tracing. Alan Wake 2 apparently uses skin geometry for its vegetation, which is not too common, and that means that grass, leaves, and tree branches all will move and look right in the shadows and reflections like you expect they would. This is an area where many games often fail when they use ray tracing, and you'll see vegetation being static or missing shadows and reflections since they rely on older tricks to kind of fake vegetation movement. Having things like vegetation though represented accurately in the BVH in Alan Wake 2 is rather expensive, as you could imagine, and I think here they added in an optimization that can sometimes be a little bit distracting. Check this out. As you move through grass patches in the game sometimes, you can see them having a popping effect as lighting applies to them as you move through them. It's almost like they're being called out of the BV-8 structure a bit aggressively. I find this a bit distracting and I would really love an option perhaps to increase or decrease quality for future GPUs and PCs. A last idiosyncrasy that I noticed that is worth mentioning is not everything is path traced to perfection. Glass, for example, with the direct lighting does not do transparency shadows or caustics, so shining a light through water or glass does not bring about cool transparent shadow effects or refraction like you might expect there. Similarly, although the reflections are incredibly true to world lighting and geometry, they don't include everything. You can see some decals here are added in screen space with this graffiti. And lastly, although we get path traced reflections for opaque geometry, the reflections shown in transparency, as we can see here, don't seem to follow the same path tracing rules. Notice how we can see Alan and the mirrors reflected here in this transparent glass surface, but we don't see the reflection of Alan in the mirror in that reflection. You get what I mean? These minor graphical inconsistencies that I'm showing off here show that the sky is the limit with ray tracing still. There's still so much more things that can be more fully ray traced or path traced in games, and games like Alan Wake 2 are are really just the beginning here. And even though this game looks incredible now, there are still many areas in the future where ray tracing could still be even better. Coming to optimization for this path tracing, I chose the RTX 3080 as it's still a rather common GPU out there, and it's still really powerful. At the same settings as the PlayStation 5, for example, we can see it achieving nearly two times the performance of the PS5, which is awesome to see, and I think Ampere GPUs are really doing well in this game and outpacing older generations. But watch what happens when I max the path tracing options with DLSS reconstruction at that same resolution and otherwise same settings. Yep, the performance goes way down. You would essentially be looking at a 30 FPS experience in this game at these settings if you wanted to max it out. Arguably you could, but I want to offer an alternative for 60 FPS with RT. So let's go through the settings. First, you have the quality settings for the indirect path tracing, which control the amount of specular bounces visible and diffuse bounces. We'll start with reflections. Here we can see, ranged from low to high, how there are less reflections in the reflections the lower you go. At the high quality level, we get all three bounces. At low and medium, there appears to just be one bounce of specular lighting, and you can see a more matte tone in the reflection of that phone booth. The difference between medium and low for specular quality is the reflection resolution. That appears to be half resolution or so at low and at full resolution at medium, and we can see that affecting the quality of smaller details in the reflection, like the text and symbols. Visually, I would say low is actually a good optimized setting here. For diffuse lighting quality, we see something similar. I would say here, even at the low setting with its limited bounces of light, we can still see a good amount of light bounce occurring. The blue light is bouncing off the bowl onto the table and windowsill. At the higher settings like medium and high, we can see more resolution and bounces there, which increase the contrast and indirect shadows and light in the bowl. But honestly, I still think it looks pretty good at low here, and I would say if the performance is good enough, which we'll talk about very soon, then it's a great optimized setting. For the transparency tracing, there's a quality switch here from low to high, which you can see reduces the 
tracing resolution of transparency. In motion, it means the low setting is just more unstable in comparison to the high setting, but I would say the low setting here is a good candidate for optimized settings. For direct lighting, you only have an on and off switch, but there is control of its denoising, and here I want to show you something interesting. Here are the three denoisers for direct lighting. They all look kind of different, and it's hard to say actually which one is most accurate as we don't have a ground truth example here to say what is most accurate. So it's a matter of taste, but the most important thing to notice is that the performance is way different between them. The denoising set to high will half the frame rate in comparison to ray reconstruction or the denoising set to low. Here, for such things as shadows, I prefer the look of ray reconstruction, and given its performance, it makes a lot of sense to use it on an NVIDIA card or low if you're not on an NVIDIA card. For the 3080 though, this test that I'm showing is very important, as it shows us that even at PS5 settings and only using RT direct lighting with the low denoiser, we're just about 60 FPS or so. So if you're we going to add in any of the indirect lighting, we would definitely be way below 60 FPS. So for something like the RTX 3080, I actually only recommend doing RT direct lighting and using ray reconstruction if you're going for a 60 FPS experience. Recommended settings get more interesting though when I drop in an RTX 4070 here, and here we can see at those PS5 settings that I showed off earlier, it underperforms next to the RTX 3080. It runs on average 14% slower than it at the same setting. But if you compare it with the full path tracing suite enabled and with ray reconstruction at those settings and res, well we can see the tables flip. 4070 is now outperforming the 3080 by 26% at 41 FPS while the 3080 is just a bit above 30 here. My recommendation for 4070 tier GPUs is to turn on indirect path tracing options and transparency to low to save some more performance and then turn on frame generation. When doing that the game is now at 80 FPS as we're seeing here and this is one of the heaviest areas in the game. It is a great deal faster as we're seeing here in the non-forest areas running at an above 100 FPS for example. So it's a pretty great experience but I would still say it's actually not perfect depending upon your input device. Now it's a bit hard to show off in this video, but the game controls really well on a controller as I'm showing here. But with a mouse, if you're not at a frame rate divisible by 30, the game can have stuttering with camera motion using a mouse, just like it did in Deathloop. Now, I don't like this at all, and I think this is something that Remedy really needs to fix and as soon as possible. Getting over to Ray Reconstruction, I have the same appreciation of it as I saw in Cyberpunk 2077, more or less. Reflections in motion are much better than the standard denoising that is provided. They really make the game look a lot better here, where we can see the old denoiser smearing in comparison to the really crisp look that we see there with Ray Reconstruction. The same with rapid lighting changes, which look snappy and natural with ray reconstruction on, but look a lot less responsive and a bit weird with ray reconstruction off. In Cyberpunk, you might recall that I said that it looked artificially sharpened at points in time, and I'd say that is lessened to a degree in Alan Wake, but it's kind of hard to say exactly why that is the case. But I still see that over sharpening occurring, and a great place to point it out is in character faces, where the sharpening aspect kind of over highlights normal maps on people's faces and makes their skin look a bit odd. It kind of destroys the subsurface scattering. In a scene like this one with Alex Casey's character, I actually think ray reconstruction is not a detriment to the realism of the material on his face. I think it looks pretty great here. But in other scenes like we can see here, I want you to notice how the ray reconstruction effect is killing the subsurface scattering on Alan Wake's skin here, making it look papery and kind of wrong as it's overemphasizing the normal maps. This sharpening is something that I think really needs to be worked on for future iterations of ray reconstruction as I find it a noticeable blemish on otherwise good results. Another thing I want to see improved is the over sharpening that can occur the lower the internal resolution is. At lower DLSS presets like we're seeing here, the game can have a more obvious posterized look than it has at higher DLSS presets. Like I said earlier, I think this game doesn't look as over sharpened as Cyberpunk does, but I still can see some of the hallmark issues that I saw in Cyberpunk, including a number of times seeing trails behind objects 
with ray reconstruction on and i really want to see this tech improve for the future but it is otherwise really great in this title and all the shots you've seen in this video have been with ray reconstruction on speaking of all the shots in this video i want to extend a special thanks to franz bauma whose cinematic photo debug camera tools that i've been using here really made this video possible and allowed me to get the insights and all the awesome cinematic shots that you've seen so far and it goes to show i think how important it is for a game with this high fidelity to launch with something like a photo mode because this game looks great and it's awesome to see all the objects and everything up close in full detail with that being said i've reached the end of this video Hopefully you have a good idea of the ray tracing and path tracing in this game, and also a little bit of a strategy to help make it run on your PC. I think Alan Wake 2 does look incredible at the moment, even with the issues I pointed out, and I cannot wait to see what Remedy does in its patching cycle for this game or in future games. If you did enjoy this video, hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. If you're already a subscriber, hit that little bell in the corner to be informed as soon as Digital Foundry posts a video. If you want to help us out, support us on Patreon to get years of our content in high quality for download. Comment below, follow on Twitter, and as always, this is Alex, bidding you farewell and auf Wiedersehen.